I remember the day that everything I understood about soils began to change. It was the day I met Ray Archuleta. I wanted to talk to him about no-till equipment, but he pointed me in a different direction. It is not about the equipment. It's about the understanding. The most important thing about it is understanding how your soil system functions. That's number one. Now the soil functions that farmers care about are the supply of water and nutrients to their crop. Soil ecologists tell us that 90% of these functions are dependent on soil biology. There's this movement through the country where people are realizing, you know what, if we farm nature's way, we start saving in inputs. Does nature disrupt itself? It doesn't do that. And if you can learn the principles, I call them the keys to the soil health, is limit disturbance, cover the soil all the time with diversity, 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 have a live root growing all the time. That's what nature does. To be honest, the skeptic inside of me did not quite believe Ray. But he began to introduce me to veterans of this movement, real farmers like Ray Steyer, Gabe and Paul Brown, and Dave Brandt, and they all seemed to be singing his song. It seems to be that the more species you have growing together, the diversity of your cover crop, the better it is. We have uh, quite the diversity in our cropland, 25 different species uh, we've grown this year, both in cover crop combinations and for cash crops. Today at this farm we have uh, 20 different covers. We have them in five-way blends, seven-way blends, eight-way blends, and 10-way blends. It took me a while to realize that these farmers were imitating nature's way by using diverse cover crops. And by doing that, they were meeting three of those four soil health keys. My aha moment happened in a corn stand in North Dakota. This side did not have compost and it did not have tea. There is no commercial fertilizer on any of them. This side is running purely off the energy of last year's cover crop. These four cornfields are probably one of the best examples of the power of diversity that I can show you. The power of diversity is extremely strong. Now had we come out here last year and planted a monoculture out here and tried to drive this corn off of a monoculture, I suspect this wouldn't look quite like it does. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Now, I could put you to sleep by talking about a recent paradigm shift in soil science that will change the face of agriculture, but I have a better idea. You see, I met three farmers who saw what I saw in North Dakota, and they acted on it. And that started a small revolution in their home county. This is the story of their rookie years in diverse cover crops. My name's Nathan Louder. I'm the district conservationist here in Stanley Montgomery County and also have uh, a farming interest in the county also where we have beef cows and row crop production. I'm Curtis Furr. I'm from Stanley County, North Carolina. John Pickler, Long Creek Farms. We grow corn, soybeans, cotton. My biggest crop's the cotton. I have uh, summers an 850 acre range of cotton. We, we raise a lot of corn for us. Uh, hunting purposes. Possibly this year may grow some popcorn. It's been since the late 60s, early 70s, we've been no-tilling here. Uh, actually, my farm is a complete no-till system. Don't use any, any type of incorporation. We've been no-tilling neighborhood of 35 years. Oh, we like no-tilling. It saves us a lot of time. We can get over the ground faster. We feel that's the way to go. You know, we got to conserve every bit of moisture because we don't never know when the dry spells going to hit us and all our, all our acres are dry land acres, no irrigation.
My sense is that most farmers viewed cover crops as an erosion control measure. Nice, but expensive and a hassle, and certainly not an asset. We used uh, cover crops behind low residue producing crops. A lot of time um, wheat was used just because it was so readily available. A uh, little bit of oats, some triticale, some rye. We've been growing cover crops for several years now, off and on, and, uh, but we just wasn't quite getting what we felt like we needed as far as the right kind of mix and the right kind of cover. Was either getting it all rye or, or too much uh, uh, too much of one thing. We always saw the opportunity that we could include something to these cover crops to help get us some additional nutrients for our next crop. But in years past, inputs were relatively cheap. I ain't gonna say cheap, but uh, you could afford to buy them. Um, so that opportunity was never really sought out. But things began to change, especially around 2008. Well, as a known fact, with fuel going to four to five dollars, we're seeing higher fertilized cost, and uh, any way that we could shave off some of the expense of the fertilizer, we're going to have to find those ways. This meant that these hard-nosed businessmen became more receptive to the new paradigm that views soils as ecosystems rather than black boxes or chemistry sets. I sat through Ray's meeting at the Ag Civic Center down here in, in Stanley County. Ah, now we're getting to it. Oh my goodness, it's the soil biology. You mean those little arthropods, the bacteria, the fungus, all these critters make organic matter. Oh, by the way, you can't have the soil biology without the plants and the plants need the microbes. Isn't the soil look beautiful? Who would have thought the soil looked something like that? Our job landowners, is to manage that habitat right here, that pore space, and keep it intact. My first impression of Ray, I thought, boy, this man's crazy. But the more I listened to him, the, I decided that he probably done and forgot more than I'll ever know about cover crops. And then he asked me and John to go with him out to North Dakota. When I went to North Dakota, it was real eye-opening uh, because those guys are working with limited moisture. They're looking at 12 inches of actual rainfall throughout a year, and they were growing some good crops with that kind of moisture. And the only way you got to be able to grow crops is to serve your moisture. Why wouldn't it work when we're in an area that's in a normal year with 40 inches of rain? But my deal is I want to drought proof the ground as good as I can. With the experience I've already had with cover crops, and going out there and seeing what they have done, just, you know, I thought, there ain't no excuse that we can't use this in North Carolina. As far as Curtis and John were concerned, there was not a moment to be lost. That was the 1st of September, and actually we needed to be a planting three weeks from that, so we had to go ahead and get our seeds lined up. Of course, me and Ray and John got separated at the airport uh, because of our flights were different. I sat down and figured out how many acres I was going to have and what I needed and called home and I had a seed order before I got home from North Dakota that year. We got the seeds lined up and we had a good stand last year. Uh, we had a heck of a cover crop. The seeds they lined up with the typical species you'd find in a standard cool season cocktail for the southeast. We had some rye, hairy vetch, crimson clover, purple top turnips, daikon radishes, winter peas, gosh, we had a lot of cover last year. Of course, that's not the only mix. Farmers across the country have become very creative in the way they introduce diversity into their land based on their resource needs the season, and the crop rotation. Now when it comes to planting cover crops, I'm going to go with the advice that Dave Brandt gives to his fellow farmers. I think sometimes we tend to worry too much about it. You know, I think we try to be too professional because we're trying to worry about corn and beans and making sure everything's right. Uh, the opinion I have on cover crops is if you've got good weather and decent soil conditions, just get it out there, 
it seems to grow whether it comes out of an airplane or a spinner spreader or of a drill or a planter. So uh, I guess there's no magic formula, just get it done and get it out there. In our situation, um, we've actually broadcast these cover crops just using a traditional three-point hitch spreader and have been successful in doing that on smaller scale in our operation. The first year we did it, uh, we used John's sprayer and sprayed and used a spin spreader. But for some reason, we got a, a streaks in it. Uh, we don't, we know, we're not sure what happened there. But in the fall of 2011, uh, we defoliated the cotton with one sprayer and then took the boom off the other and put a pendulum back and forth motion spreader on. And that seemed to work great. We, we decided this fall we did not broadcast. Uh, we put 800 acres in the ground this year with the, uh, with the drill. But it's also according to how your seasons run. I mean, the guys that, that maybe throwed it out, broadcast it this fall, we had plenty of rain in the fall, which that was a big help on the broadcasting side. In fact, there were some days that we couldn't run because it was too wet. So uh, we did hold off a few days of planting because of rain. So, uh, but that, that's one of those things, you know. It's called farming, you know. There was no additional fertilizer added to those cover crops for establishment. They were just picking up off of residual in and also any uh, nitrogen that they were making while growing through the legumes. Establishing these early and then terminating them late um, in the growing season, usually when other producers have uh, already planted their crops, allows the rye to get very, very tall, usually six feet or higher. So we saw a, uh, I ain't gonna say a problem, but we saw a challenge as far as planting into that residue being so big. But we adapted, overcame, and have been successful with that. Last year was the first year that we actually rolled any cover crops down, but we saw the benefits of what you could do if you rolled it completely down. I let the rye get to soft dough stage, so as soon as it was snapped, it was terminated. But since we were not using a roller crimper, then we would have to use a herbicide to burn down the legumes. When we were doing the wheat cover crops, we didn't have to worry about rolling it. You know, we would just plant right into it. This rye is a different animal. You've got so much more biomass there. You've got to get it to the ground. And it's a lot easier as far as being able to see to plant. I would think it would be easier as far as the colders and row cleaners to cut in it with it standing. I'll be honest, our cover crop was so tall last year. We could not have planted it if we hadn't rolled it down. The timing of the burn down application differs for Nathan, John and Curtis. Their reasons are both practical and a matter of preference. For example, Nathan's sprayer is too small to get over the top, so he has to spray once it's rolled. Bar sprayer, we didn't have any trouble getting over the top of it. We have a high clearance sprayer. We were, we were putting more, more water down in there and we were running higher pressure. And we actually slowed up some too. We slowed up higher water pressure and more water to blow it down in it and I would terminate these crops probably about two to three days in front of the roller. We can get a better kill with the crops while they're still standing. Curtis just likes to get it done all at once. We took advantage of some of the equipment that we had on the farm that we've been using when we tilled the soil. Just like this color packer here, we're using it to roll rye and cover crop down and we're spraying as we go behind it and then we, we had this roller hard that we hadn't used in years. We drug it out of the weeds and uh, just put it behind the color packer. And we actually double rolling and crimping it as we go. It's breaking the rye up in pieces. We saving one trip with a spray truck or sprayer and actually doing two jobs at one time. And it's worked out real great for us. Farmers who have never done this sort of thing before, planting into a rolled, high biomass cover crop is just plain scary. 
our rookies had their share of problems in this phase and yet seem to have come out on top. Again, after you roll those cover crops down, timing of planting is going to be crucial also. We did have some wrapping issues on our row cleaners, but we had a situation where uh, we did not get it sprayed like we wanted uh, because of windy days. We have found that if you can plant in real green rye or it re be real dead, that in between, this rye gets tough when it's trying to dry down. So uh, that, that was, our, that was our, our main deal last year. It was in that tough stage. Late termination often brings with it the worry of low soil moisture at planting. Old hands like Ray Steyer like to terminate as late as possible, but local conditions and sound judgment will always play a role. It's just like this. I would love to see, a, after we terminate and lay it down, I'd love to see a good rain on it. That's going to add that soil moisture back there. When you lay that mat on top of it, you won't be disturbing your moisture again. We love to plant right after rain, yeah. And as always, there's the talk of equipment. Again, there was no secret formula. We didn't make any major adjustments to our planter other than just keeping everything in tune, keeping colders updated as needed. We did add a little bit of weight to our planter to make sure you could cut through the residue. It's just a no-till colder, double disc opener, and cast iron closing wheels. I think one key thing there is keeping good sharp colders on the planter. You may not get but half the life out of them, but getting a good stand is worth the difference there. Keeping them sharp and then keeping good, uh, a close eye on your row cleaners, keeping them at the right depth. And the ones I got, just pull a pin and you can adjust them real easy. And you might also want to ask whether they were always able to cut through that mat. We did, we did have some issues last year. Our problems was on the turn rows where we would come out and try to cross before the roller had laid it the other way. Biggest thing, you want to follow that roller as close as possible as far as going with the way your rye has been laid down. Given that rolled cover crop, I wanted to know whether there was any effect on weed control. The rolling down definitely give a lot of benefits in weed control. Having that uniform mat of heavy residue down only allowed sun to penetrate where you were planting. The weeds just can't come up through that thick mat. We had a 98% weed control. Good, good, good weed control this year. I know what you're thinking. All this talk about cover crops is nice and all, but how did crops respond in the growing season? I visited a bit with Curtis and Nathan in August 2011 to see how things were going. We definitely have seen the moisture retention and with the soil health improving, we're just seeing a lot healthier crops that we're planting. Got a, a pretty decent stand as you can see. It's, uh, the spots have filled in great uh, and they still have a whole lot of residue left on the ground and uh, the ground's still real moist. I'm just tickled to death with it. This ear corn is a little over eight inches long, got 16 rows of kernels on it and uh, I'm looking at probably 200 bushel plus corn here. I've been real pleased with it. When we visited John's fields, his corn stands looked just as impressive. Moisture, you could go out there on a dry day and kick, kick the cover back and you could still see dark dirt. I just love the idea of uh, having that organic base and having the soil temperatures down during these hot June and July months. Roots is, is more bigger. They seem to be looking for the moisture and what it is they going to, they finding that moisture underneath that mat. I'm really protecting myself for June and July. That's what I look after when we're thinking about cover crops. You could rake that cover crop back and dig down just a little bit and earthworms is just crawling and eating them microbes is the way Ray calls it. <laughs> but what Nathan showed me in some nearby fields just blew me away. 
what we're looking at here is a uh, two different producers that have uh, two different management types for the cotton rotation that they're pre are currently in. We did take some soil temperature readings back when it was 105 one day, and the field on the left you can see was more or less reading 105 at an inch deep. The field on the right was reading 85. So you, we had right around an approximate 20 degree difference in soil temperature between those two fields. And just looking at, I mean, side by side comparison, I mean, it tells the tale. There's an old management adage that says, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. Ultimately, it's the yield that provides us with the verdict for the cover crops. Our first year that we did the cover crops, we saw a small yield increase. Typical corn yields were 120 to 150 bushel corn. That year we were seeing where we had the cover crops, 170, 180 bushel corn, in comparison to where we had the 150 right beside it. Yield this year on dryland corn was, uh, we averaged 145 bushels. I think the county average is 90. I would be willing to say that we had a 10 bushel yield increase this year on corn just because of the cover crops. Well, we had some good corn, 150, 75 bushel corn. And I'd say where I used cover crops, they were 10% better. We were right in, there, in the range of 1,200 pounds this year on cotton. Everywhere that, that it was planted on time and everything was done right, it was 1,200 to 1,500 pound cotton. And where there was no cover crop, it was probably 100 pounds less than that. If you're making a living on farming, you have to ask yourself, can I afford to do this? Is there a benefit both now and in the future? Well, it seems like seed cost is high, but if, if you put a pencil to it and what you're eventually going to get out of it is cheap. Well, if you could take $7 corn, cover crops doubled what it cost it to put in. It made us money. With corn at six fifty to $7, you know, you got cotton in the 90 to a dollar a pound range. You cannot afford to leave anything on the table as far as trying to, trying to make your, your biggest returns. And I don't know of a bigger return there is than soil moisture. You reap what you sow. It takes money to make money. And these crops that we put out this year or last year, that's going to work down into the soil, and it's going to be with us for a long time. I can just see lots of benefits that could come down the road from this, other than just a one-year deal. The cover crop mix that we use could provide you anywhere from 50 to 150 units of nitrogen. At current nitrogen cost per unit pound, it's more than paid for itself. As far as the future is concerned, each of our friends has chosen his own path. In the future, I could very well see in certain situations on our farm, just depending on landscape, that we could grow our crops without any synthetic inputs. I'm, I'm going to try cutting back and also I'm going to do my own on-farm test on a few things, uh, like planting with no fertilizer and then putting half of it and then putting a full amount and maybe some extra, but I'm going to play with that some too this year. We're so young in this program. I think before we start backing off on nutrients, we need to uh, at least three to four years. I would say, probably down the road, we're gonna cut nutrients back probably a third, maybe a half. But are these expectations realistic? Let's visit again with the guys who have been committed to this for a while. The last seven years, we've reduced our fertilizer costs by as much as 75%, and I'm really hoping that in the next two years, I can learn to reduce it to zero. I haven't used any nitrogen on my corn since 1996. We've cut our fertilizer by 90% and our herbicide use by 75%. And we have not reached a plateau yet. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that anyone knows where the plateau is. And we think that we're just going to keep pushing the system forward and see where it takes us from here. Oh my goodness. The no-till, 
Same soil type. Why did that happen? Why did the no-till allow the water to go through? Did you hear what Mackie said? About 500 years ago, Nicola Machiavelli wrote that there is nothing more difficult to carry out than to initiate a new order of things. This is partly due to the incredulity of mankind who would not believe in anything new until they have actually experienced it. But Stanley County has changed since that North Dakota trip. But coming home and people, my neighbors think, they thought that poor boy has lost his mind. He don't know what he, he's gonna lose his butt and have auction sale this next fall. But it's worked out. They got an open mind to it now instead of a turning their backs to it and say, oh, he's lost his mind. And uh, I've had a lot of people call me and, and uh, wanting to know what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and, and if it pays off. And uh, I've tried to be as honest as I could with everybody and tell them, yeah, it's, it's worked good for me. In Stanley County, we're starting to see more and more producers adopt the use of the cover crop mixes. As we have more and more field days, more and more outreach trainings, more producers are becoming aware of it, whether they see it or hear it from me, hopefully see it or hear it from their neighbor. It makes me feel good to actually know that we've addressed the resource and uh, are doing good things to help conserve it.